Funding for the art show is made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District and viewers like you. Thank you. In this edition of the art show, we talk with founders and artists of the K-12 Gallery and Tejas. Just a little seed of inspiration can really change a person's life and many other people's lives too in the process. Experience bluegrass heritage in Ohio. I'm convinced that it's important in my sense of identification of who I am. And see Roman ruins come to life. Artists have been inspired by Pompeii from the rediscoveries in the mid-1700s right through to the present day. It's all ahead on this edition of The Art Show. Hello. I'm Rodney Veal, and this is The Art Show. Each week, we hope to expose you to new local, regional, and national artists and arts organizations. This week, we begin in Dayton, where artists of all ages have the opportunity to express themselves. Not only is the K-12 Gallery in Tejas providing that opportunity to inner city kids, but it is also encouraging community involvement and inciting inspiration. Dream and vision can be coupled with another person's strategic plan. Strategic plans and vision, that's what creates innovation. Dayton is known as a town of innovation and invention with an abundance of great engineers. But rarely do we group innovation and art together. K-12 Gallery in Tejas is working to change that. I think what sets us apart from any other sort of center is that we're not afraid to take risks in our projects. So we have these great, really creative, large-scale projects that we do. We're fortunate here in Dayton to have so many creative outlets. We provide this one-of-a-kind experience for people, so they really can get creative and get messy here and not have so many of the boundaries that I think other places provide. In 1993, Jerry Standard was inspired to start the K-12 Gallery after visiting a children's art festival in State College, Pennsylvania. She was a first-year art teacher for Dayton Public Schools. Just a little seed of inspiration can really change a person's life, and many other people's lives, too, in the process. Once people are really inspired to do things, to move, to move in a positive direction, other things come about. The really cool thing about this program is that we have kids in here from every area, every background, every race. We serve everybody. The depth of what we do all is surrounded by the inner city kid. And those inner city kids aren't necessarily all coming from Dayton anymore. There's West Carrollton, there's Xenia, there's Kettering, and these, these pockets of children that have lower resources than what we have are coming from all over. And uh, they attend our artist and training program. And that's every day after school. We train their right brain to use their creative energy in a positive direction. The gallery has a great scholarship program to assist those who may not have the ability to pay for an art class. Going one step further, the gallery is also in partnership with the Montgomery County Juvenile Court, encouraging youth to express themselves in more constructive ways. HALO is the brainchild of Jerry Standard, um, and HALO stands for Helping Adolescents Achieve Long-Term Objectives. Basically, at that time, the levees were failing, Dayton Public Schools was losing their arts programming, and Jerry has always seen that there has been a lack of art services for at-risk youth. So she reached out to us and had the idea for the HALO program. Judge Koontz and Judge Capizzi and our probation directors have always been supportive of alternative programming like this. We are a strength-based court, so we believe that what works for one kid may not work for another. So if we can expose them to different um, elements in the community, uh, such as arts or theater, those sort of things, then hopefully we can light a spark in them and find their passion. And in turn, they start to feel good about themselves and give back to their community. We have teens that come in and work on large-scale public art. We have about 15 large-scale public murals that went up in the last couple of years. And so we're working on our third phase this year. They learn about 
not only skills like team building and working in a group, but they get that one-on-one -on -one instruction. And when they are committing crimes, they aren't thinking about the community as a whole and what they're doing in that moment. But when they come in and they do these large-scale paintings, and then we put them up on abandoned buildings in the community, they start to take ownership for their community. And we make a big deal out of these unveilings. I mean, we invite the city commissioners, the sheriffs, the mayor. We want everybody to come down and celebrate what these kids are doing. So when they see that everybody's coming out for them, they start to feel good about themselves and realize, I'm part of a bigger pi picture here. I, I can make a difference in the community. And then when I get through that window, there's still more possibilities of that person. They are building friendships. They are building a network system that we today don't even know how it will impact our community or the world in the future. We just, we don't know how those connections will impact the bigger picture. K-12 Gallery in Tejas has some big plans for their new location on Jefferson Street. It includes revolving exhibitions, new glass and darkroom studios, and a one-of-a-kind artist's market. With our new space, the walls and the space itself can be utilized by so much more than what we had in our old space. We could do large-scale installations here. We could do large exhibitions of different types of sculptures or pottery. The potential is endless, and that's really exciting to all of us. You're going to find something new, and you're going to see uh, us reinvent ourselves, along with the help of hundreds of artists that uh, come and go from K-12 and Tejas every day. K-12 Gallery in Tejas, which stands for Teen Educational and Joint Adult Studio, offers classes for ages three and up. Evening, Saturday, and open studio classes are available, so check their annual schedule at k12gallery.org. In this next segment, Ohioan Katie Lauer brings her Tennessee heritage to a new audience and transcends many of the stereotypes associated with bluegrass. When you go down to the belly, keep your money in your shoes. Women in the belly, got the belly blues. Oh, sweet mama, that's got the deep belly blues. It's the distinctive sound of bluegrass played in festivals all over Ohio. Katie Lauer, a bluegrass pioneer, has spent some 40 years playing the music she loves and teaching listeners what bluegrass is all about. Her skills as a band leader, songwriter, and singer have garnered her attention and admiration across the United States, especially in Ohio. Just one of the reasons why Katie is a recipient of the Ohio Heritage Fellowship Award. The Ohio Heritage Fellowship Awards were created back in 2004. It's a way for the Ohio Arts Council with city folk creating a showcase for these great artists to recognize artists who are great practitioners in their field um, that may apply to a tradition that's thriving such as bluegrass, but also applies to other traditions which are more endangered. Uh, these are traditions that have been handed down generation to generation. My family was always musical. Back in Tennessee, we had been the go-to guys for music for funerals, graduations, weddings. Everybody called us and we'd get whoever we could get together, a combination of relatives that were compatible musically, and we'd go sing. I'm convinced that's important in my sense of identification of who I am. If somebody saw me and they'd say, who is that? And they wouldn't say that's my name. They would say that's Mason Ward's granddaughter or Nancy Ward's granddaughter or Booth Haley's granddaughter. You had an identity based on your clan and your place in that clan. I understudied my Aunt Dot, who was the lead singer, and then my dad when she died. And then one day I woke up and my dad was dead. And I had this awful feeling that I was the lead singer in the family and I was supposed to be there. And I wasn't. 
it was uh, poignant. Holding fast to their musical identity through times of change, the family moved north to find work. Katie later settled in Cincinnati with her husband. I can remember walking down Main Street with some friends of mine one night, and they had said, you've got to go to this place called Aunt Maudie's. And they've got this great music, you'll just love it. And we went and opened the door, and there was Jim McCall and David Cox and Junior McIntyre, Vernon McIntyre, and they were playing the Salty Dog Blues. Well, I just was transfigured. I just had to, I, I don't think I went home after that. I just uh, went in and sat down and became obsessed with that music and I had to play it. She's got everything she needs. She's an artist, she don't look back. She's got everything she needs. She's an artist, she don't look back. She can take the dark out of the night time, make the daytime seem black. There have always been women from the very beginning included in bluegrass music as songwriters, as singers, as even as instrumentalists, but they weren't prominent until the 1970s. And Katie Lauer, as she began to bring her band forward in Cincinnati in the mid-1970s, was unique. She was one of only, oh, three or four female bluegrass band leaders in the world. She was a bridge between the professional college-educated audiences in Cincinnati, the folk music crowd, the jazz music crowd, with what it would have been previously a separate culture the Appalachian, quote, hillbilly bars of the over the Rhine neighborhood. Katie Lauer bridged those two scenes. She was comfortable in both of them, and she taught people on both sides of that divide to become comfortable in new ways, crossing over into each other's territories. It never occurred to me that I was doing something trailblazing or anything like that. Katie Lauer, as much as anyone in Ohio, brought bluegrass to new audiences. She legitimized bluegrass music for people who wouldn't have been caught dead listening to it, particularly in the Cincinnati area. One other way in which Katie is talented is that she has a radio program called Music from the Hills of Home on WNKU from Northern Kentucky University. There's a guy named Wayne Clyburn that does it with her. Alan O'Brien. Alan O'Brien on tenor. <laughs> on that first whippoorwill, which to me, that song is always the first sign of spring. Today, of course, was the Hillbilly Equinox. Hillbilly Equinox. <laughs> Boy, I don't know if that's on any calendars. Katie Lauer's program on Sunday evenings is one of those events in the life of a bluegrass music fan that they seek out and make sure that they are there for. I found that people weren't as knowledgeable of bluegrass as I'd have liked. As a matter of fact, bluegrass was in a lull in Ohio. And through the nearly 20 years that we've been doing it now, I think we've gotten a lot of that message out there. And I think we've made it more interesting for people to listen to with some of our sidebars. I describe her as a patch in Ohio's rich cultural quilt. Uh, Katie makes Ohio, Katie's artistic contributions have made Ohio more Ohio, more exciting, more interesting. She's brought the peoples of Ohio together in interesting ways. She's brought young people, older people, rural people, urban people, educated people, less educated people, men, women, together in interesting ways around culture and around art. She's been a leader. She's been an organizer. She's been a central focus. She's been a multi-artist, playing both bluegrass and jazz and written word uh, as a writer. She's exemplified what it means to devote a life to, to the arts in Ohio. I do think we need to be educated because we have dumbed down our music until it's two chords and 
there's no virtuosity, there's no learning, there's no spending years learning an instrument, which is not only an important discipline, but it is important. It's important for your soul. While city folk disbanded at the close of 2013, there are still opportunities locally to catch some bluegrass tunes. Log on to centralohiobluegrass.com or villageofclifton.com and click the Clifton Opera House for concert dates. Are you an artist or know an artist with an interesting story? Pitch it to us. Send an email to theartshow at thinktv.org. Include contact information and links to performances or art samples online. In this last segment, we walk through the Pompeii exhibit at the Cleveland Art Museum in Ohio. The ancient artifacts that have been uncovered from the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD continue to be a source of inspiration for artists. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius, it's a you know, tremendous explosive eruption, but what happens is that the volcanic material goes way up into the sky and starts to tumble down actually relatively slowly. There's pumice, there's ash, but it gives people time to leave. And so the bodies that you find in Pompeii and in Herculaneum are the people who really stayed behind, who didn't sort of take the signs over the course of you know 18 hours and actually left. So most people really do leave the city. But what it allows us to see though is that there's this incredibly intact city underneath. Artists have been inspired by Pompeii from the rediscoveries in the mid-1700s right through to the present day. But those ch really have changed over time. I mean, the way that artists have depicted Pompeii hasn't been the same, and it really reflects contemporary interests that change enormously over time. And so one of the earlier paintings in the exhibition from the late 1700s by an artist, German artist named Hackert. I mean, Hackert shows the excavations of Pompeii and it's really a landscape painting in the tradition of lands European landscape painting that happens to show this excavation site in the middle of the landscapes. What I find so interesting about the painting is that Hackert makes a big effort to put sort of country folk in the foreground of the painting. So he really wants us to understand that Pompeii is not purely an archeological site. You definitely see workers with wheelbarrows in the background, but it's also you know, really seeing Pompeii as also a beautiful landscape. And that's, whether that's true or not, I think is almost beside the point, but I think for Hackard's audience and for the British Lord who ultimately owned this painting, it was as much about a beautiful postcard of the Bay of Naples as well as a document of the excavations as they stood in the late 1790s. Joseph Franck's painting shows three women being demolished by the eruption. I mean, literally, you see the eruption taking place in the background. The women are being tossed aside. Everything is chaos. The bodies are pulled right to the front of the picture plane. So unlike the painting by Hackert, which is all about this kind of rational scientific archaeology, Franck is interested in the drama, in the destruction, in the real soap opera of the disaster itself. Franck is an artist who, his painting is based on some archaeological evidence. There was some jewelry that was found and some bones were found nearby. And so Franck then spins this invented story about how there were these three women who just happened to be, you know, entirely naked, who are being tossed aside, um, leave, but you know, seem to have like been clutching their jewelry right before um, they were escaping, trying to escape Pompeii, but an escape that of course turns out to be entirely futile. So Netti's painting showing the aftermath of the gladiator battle is on the one hand, extremely accurate archeologically. I mean, the building that they're in is a known 
archaeological site was actually recently excavated just before Netti made his painting. A lot of the details in the painting, for example, the gladiator helmet or the mosaic columns, these are known antiquities. So these are like really things you could have gone to a museum in Naples and seen at the time. You can still see these works today. But the story itself is entirely made up. So it's this gladiator who's killed another one in the street, seemingly as entertainment, with this drunken orgy in the background. You have gluttony, you have vice, you have sex. And all of this turns out to be entirely made up. All of these vices are in a way interpreted as a kind of premonition of the disaster that was to come. I mean, they really deserved it. They had it coming. Whether that's true or not is a kind of completely separate thing, but I think this painting is talking both about the fantasies that people have projected onto Pompeii, but also this kind of moral judgment that has gone alongside that. In the late 50s, Mark Rothko gets this really important commission to decorate the walls of the Four Seasons restaurant in New York at the top of the Seagram building. So this incredibly important, very public commission. And in the middle of the project, he actually goes to Italy. He takes a vacation with his family. He goes to Pompeii and really rethinks the whole composition, the whole room, the whole project in light of his experience at Pompeii. And I think for Rothko, it's both the association with disaster, but also the association with the decadence. And so his concerns about this restaurant being merely a place for the richest people in New York to sort of feed and show off and ignore his paintings gets in a way wrapped up in the way that he paints them. Ultimately, it's this commission that doesn't really work at all for Rothko. He withdraws from the commission. The paintings are never installed. And they are this incredibly beautiful, moving experience. Um, but one that is very much associated with Pompeii in a very direct way, really, even in his own words. Warhol, I think, really gets interested in this idea of complete and total apocalypse. I think it's something he's thinking about both in terms of the recent earthquake in 1980 in the Bay of Naples, I think he's also looking back and thinking about things like atomic disaster, and I think he's very much thinking of very contemporary cataclysms. In the case of the mid-80s, we're talking about the AIDS crisis, and I'm convinced that these works, at least on some level, address that contemporary disaster. And the thing about this exhibition is that, on the one hand, we could have just shown paintings of Mount Vesuvius and the erupting volcano and the very straightforward representations of the city. But Pompeii really goes into artists' minds in a much deeper and more complicated way. And so there are abstract artists who are deeply affected by their experiences of Pompeii and their thoughts about the ancient city. And so a lot of the works in the exhibition aren't necessarily kind of literal depictions of Pompeii, but really artistic imaginings of Pompeii. I mean, it's really about the way that Pompeii has sunk into the modern and the contemporary imagination over several hundred years. To learn more, visit clevelandart.org. And if this has piqued your interest in how artists interpret history, visit the Dayton Art Institute and ask about what is a masterpiece. This interactive tour of the permanent collection uses QR codes and mobile technology to provide an in-depth information about select works in the collection. Have you ever stood in front of a work of art and wanted to understand it better? The Dayton Art Institute is using mobile technology to give visitors a new way to see its treasures at their own pace. Either use your own mobile device using the museum's free Wi-Fi or check out an iPad from the visitor service desk. To join the conversation or learn more about a work, simply tab the icon and point the camera at the QR code. QR stands for Quick Response. You can also choose to browse works by department. We invite you to be curious. The artworks in What is a Masterpiece are scattered all throughout the museum's collections, so try exploring an area of world art that is unfamiliar to you. 
Everything you need to create a profound experience with the permanent collection of DAI is now at your fingertips. Don't expect to take a back seat with what is a masterpiece. For every artwork on this tour, you can tell the museum, as well as other visitors, what you think about it and what the idea of masterpiece means to you. Throughout your visit, participate in polls and share your thoughts and opinions on any masterpiece in the program. Now the museum is in your hands. Log on to the Wi-Fi, scan a QR code, and open up a world of discovery. And that wraps it up for this edition of The Art Show. Remember, your town has a very active arts community, so get out there and support it. I certainly do. Until next time, I'm Rodney Veal, and thanks for watching. Funding for the Art Show is made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District and viewers like you. Thank you.